Hello and welcome to Gritty Reboot, the show where we make fun of TV's dark side. I'm Sarah Dunaway and with me is Kevin James. Kevin, how are you? I've had a very strange week. Uh, I learned just a few days ago that the viral hit song, Chocolate Rain from 2010, is not a silly song as we had all thought, but is in fact a searing indictment of systemic racism and the institutional biases that prevent people from recognizing its existence. Wow, that's uh, that's very interesting, but that doesn't really have anything to do with Archie or Riverdale. I know, I know. I broke the format, but this fact broke my brain and I had to share it. Okay, well, moving on. Also with us is Hunter Markham. Hunter, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Just indulging in my pastime of stealing the Letterman jackets of murdered teens. It's more of a calling than anything else. And what do you do with the jackets? Just some light fondling and caressing. Nothing too forward. You know what? I actually don't want to know. I would like to know more. (laughs) That is behind the paywall. (laughs) Behind our paywall, we now have a uh, Josie and the Pussycats uh, commentary. And jacketing off with Hunter Markham. (laughs) (laughs) Which dovetails nicely into my Tara Reid seminar, (laughs) where I reveal how many movies starring her I've seen, which is soon to be in the double digits. Yeah, we're we're not just a Riverdale fan account anymore. We are now branching out into as many Tara Reid-related mediums as possible. Wherever she can be found, we'll track her down. Uh, I am super excited about this episode because Cheryl came back. (laughs) Finally. Uh, We missed her a lot. I did not realize how awful her dialogue was until she came back in this episode, but she makes up for lost time. Yes, she she roars back into this episode, and sadly, I think that might be the only really good thing about this episode, because it was, oh man, it was so slow and so little happened. I have, I found some things to love about it, besides Cheryl reappearing and being more cringeworthy than usual, but, I mean, we can get into all this stuff. I know you, apparently this episode title is a reference to a film. I didn't know it, and I didn't even think to look. I thought they just made this one up. Yeah, uh, so this one is In a Lonely Place, which is uh, a 1950 noir film. It even has Humphrey Bogart, the noir king, but... What are some better names we could come up with? There are millions of them. Sarah, have you got a couple? I do. I thought Flowers in the Attic (laughs) because of the attic and also the incest vibes. And then there's also apparently a film called The People Under the Stairs. Obviously a reference to Jughead. It's like a horror movie? I would assume. I've heard of it. I think it's like a cult classic. Um, I had a couple... Some of them, well, I don't even know where I was going. Uh, 16 and pregnant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nobody puts baby in the attic. <laughs> Hot jug time machine. Mm-hmm. Because Jughead is extremely sexy in this shower scene we get. Oh, yeah. In those state-of-the-art Riverdale facilities. And uh, the John Wayne classic film, The Searchers. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of struggled to come up with titles this episode, so I, I went with the very boring Something's Gotta Give. Um, <laughs> I also went with a bad pun of Jugment Day. <laughs> the best one I had, though, was it wound up just being what we titled this podcast episode, Natural Born Filler, which <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen Natural Born Killers. Really fun movie. Um <laughs> I felt like they were, like, subtly visually referencing that with the opening dream sequence, but we'll get to that when we get to that. I didn't even remember writing down this joke title, but apparently at some point I wrote Baby Theft 3000, Journey to the Center of White Hot Oblivion. <laughs> you have a gift for titles, Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> so catchy. <laughs> they never let me... I'm challenging the Riverdale writers to let me title one episode. <laughs> Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, hit us up. We know you're a fan. I'm just saying, you you ask and you'll receive my best work. <laughs> All right, should we uh, should we play our super cut of the cultural references? Yes, I got those queued up right over here. Where it's just you and the mice and the spiders, like an extra in a Wes Craven movie. 
Some retail therapy to salve my emotional wounds, a few treasures from Glamazon.com. Did I just notice Riverdale High's very own Holden Caulfield put his arm around you? Dudley Do-Right doesn't know I'm a serpent. Football, for one. And we single-handedly defeated our arch rivals, the Baxter High. Yeah, he doesn't like, care about that stuff, Fred. Yeah, it, it was called the Fred Head. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, with the what now? Yeah. Is any of this helping? Mm. Going out, going black swan, any of it? She's 10 years old. And listens to Pink Floyd on vinyl. I don't think she could get any cooler. Well, those Paradise Lost kids went to death row because they wore black and they listened to Metallica. There are a number of those that kind of stumped me. I think the one that stumped me the most was when the final one, when Jughead mentions the Paradise Lost Kids, who I had to look up and I was like, oh yeah, I've always heard of them as the West Memphis Three, though. Mm -hmm. I but had the to look film is called Paradise Lost. I have definitely seen every single documentary about this <laughs> and read several of the court transcripts like a normal person. It's fine. What I think we should point out to is... Uh the the not using trademark names in this episode is really sad glamazon.com and there was another one i missed until our oh. rewatch this morning uh veronica doesn't have american express she has american excess mm -hmm. i've actually been collecting these throughout the season because i was actually a few others i went back and found this is i'm so glad you brought this up uh in episode one Kevin actually mentions not Walmart, but Malmart. Oh my god. And then in the previous episode where Val is talking to Archie about how she met the Pussycats, she references Power Records instead of Tower Records. Yep. At least Power Records is like a believable thing someone would name a store. Yeah. So I think... This is sort of, I don't know if they're doing this to avoid trademark or like they think it's really fun or maybe this is part of Archie Comics that I'm not aware of. No idea. Um, other ones, Dudley Do-Right, he's, uh, I, I actually had to look this up to verify because I'm like, no, that's just an expression, right? No. No, turns out, character from Rocky and Bullwinkle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a Canadian Mountie. Yeah, oh, you, you know you're Rocky and Bullwinkle. Yeah. <laughs> and they did a live action Dudley Do-Right movie with Brendan Fraser. Yeah, I try to forget about that part, but yes. <laughs> Brendan <laughs> Fraser is the male equivalent of Tara Reid. I've seen every <laughs> Brendan Fraser film. Wow. Uh, who hasn't enjoyed George of the Jungle like seven or eight times back to back? See? You just put it on repeat. It comes back around. I'm trying to think if I've ever seen... I th I've seen one... You had Brendan to have seen Fraser. The Mummy. Uh, I'm not sure I have. I've seen one that involves like uh, him being stuck in some kind of like bomb shelter. Oh, Blast from the Past. There we go. Christopher Walken and Alicia Silverstone. Yeah. Not that, that I would. Not that, I know not that, that that's your favorite movie. movie or anything, but you know. All right. So the Baxter High Ravens, they really are Riverdale's arch rivals in the comics. And uh, the Fredheads, okay, so this might be a stretch. I was like, is this just a cute pun or is this actually a reference? Because Fred Heads is also the name of a documentary about Nightmare on Elm Street. And in a later episode of Riverdale, there's a flashback to Fred's band, the Fred Heads, and they're playing the song Dream Warriors, which is from the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Oh, didn't Dokin do that song? Yes. So I... I it's, useless information. <laughs> it's... I, it's there's enough there, I think it could be a reference, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's a stretch, but maybe. I don't know. <laughs> the one thing that really upset me was Veronica's once again going through these references. She says, Holden Caulfield. I think that a way we could have improved her line is if she had said, Did I just notice Riverdale High's very own... Lyos Koshu. Put his arm around you. <laughs> Because we just need a lot more Kashuth references. He's he's really the mascot of our podcast at this point. Hungarian revolutionary from 1848. Lejoy <laughs> Kashut. I was very upset that she compared him to Holden Caulfield. That no one not, deserves that. No one deserves that. What is she doing? I don't know. Veronica consistently upsets me. And she refers to Reggie as like disposable arm candy at some point in here. And I'm like, he is so much more than that. He has the only funny line in the entire episode. Oh my God. It was so good. I actually, when we were watching the first, the first time and I was taking notes, I paused after Veronica said, 
my mom said there's one thing that can't take away from me. And I was writing a joke along the same lines of what Reggie said. And then when I hadn't paused, I said, your trust fund? And I was like, oh, I lost it so hard. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that no one else laughs and Josie gives him sort of a mean glare when he said that, I was like... Reggie, you need better friends. He's so unappreciated in his own time. You can see why he's about to transfer to the 13 Reasons Why school. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't have any other huge notes on the cultural references, but some of the other stuff I'm sure we will catch up with as we go along. Not even the dream sequence at the beginning? Oh, yeah. That's like, that's really the first scene we have to tackle. That was, whew. Here's my thought. It seemed like earlier on it was established that Jughead's opening and closing monologues were part of his novel. And it got me thinking that, like, this book is going to be so disjointed because (laughs) none of this ties together if you just put them all in one document. Yeah, that's you're completely right. It's just like a weird book of haikus of him opining about different emotions. Well, it's clearly taken a left turn from being a story about Jason Blossom's murder to a diary. Yeah, that's really what it's become. So it's a little strange because in some of these monologues, he specifically references Archie and Grundy and their affair. So like, what is that doing in a book about Jason Blossom's murder? Yeah, um, but that whole dream sequence. So it's it's constructed to be very visually reminiscent of the characters as they appeared in the comics. But it's also got like cheesy sitcom lighting and some jaunty tunes And uh, in case people haven't seen Natural Born Killers, it's a very satirical movie. And they have these two scenes which are filmed in the style of like an 80s sitcom to portray the main female character's um, sexually abusive father. And like it's portrayed as like, this is how we minimize sexual assault victims in this country. Do you feel bad yet? And it, it felt like this whole scene to me was just like inspired by that. I don't know. It's just like, it's so uncanny. There's the underlying darkness. There's the hints of violence. It felt like it was coming from there. Well, I have not seen that film. Yeah. So you could be right. Or not. (laughs) I haven't seen it in ages. That was like Juliette Lewis's character in that, right? Yeah. It's one of my favorite films. Um, Or it was the last time I saw it. Maybe I should watch it. It's been like 10 years. So... In this dream sequence, Jughead and Betty are married because we see a ring on Betty's finger when she puts Mm -hmm. her paw on Jughead's. So he's really taking things to their logical extreme here in his (laughs) subconscious. But I think we were all wondering, like, why does Archie show up and in this dream and say, like, oh, you stabbed me in the back? I don't get that. Yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think it makes complete sense. He's concerned that him dating Betty is a betrayal of Archie because he knows that Archie sort of had her on his back burner or whatever. And yet that's not dealt with at all in the episode. They're just like, ah, stuff happens. Like, ah, stuff. Yeah. Like, (laughs) Hey, like Archie had his shot with Betty, but ever since he shot her down in episode one, he's made out with like three different characters that we've seen with like Veronica, Grundy, and Val. So he clearly isn't interested in Betty. My rationale was more, oh yeah, you've backstabbed him by writing about his illegal affair inside (laughs) your novel. That would make more sense. It's, It's also weird because Jughead at this point is written kind of callously towards others, except for Betty. So it's weird that he now suddenly is like, oh no, I'm worried that by dating someone my friend isn't interested in, I might be betraying them. When like three episodes ago, he's like, yeah, sorry you're being statutorily raped, but I've got other things to deal with. (laughs) Uh, My drive-in's closing, fuck off. We see Jughead wearing an S shirt in this scene, or an S sweater, I guess, and he wears an S shirt throughout this episode. And I think we all know what this means. Jughead is Superman. (laughs) So it's interesting they choose not to reveal it until now, but I think it's a great twist. Finally. Yeah, see, this is the Smallville Riverdale crossover that we've all been waiting for. (laughs) Smallverdale. Yeah, Jughead, we learned that Jughead has a lot of famous characters in this episode because he's living under a cupboard. He's Harry Potter. (laughs) He is. He's the boy who lived. At school. school. (laughs) (laughs) Under the stairs, just like Harry. Most importantly, in the shower scene, we finally see Jughead without his hat. (laughs) 
and his <laughs> hair looks great. <laughs> Why are you covering that up? You look fantastic. You know, let it roar. Absolutely. Yeah, and he's also shirtless, and so we can confirm this point. Like, KJ Apatitis is spreading. Like, it is. Archie's been shirtless. Betty's been shirtless twice. Jughead. Now we just need Veronica, Cheryl, and Kevin, and we'll have hit the whole main cast with this <laughs> wasting disease. <laughs> I didn't even realize or, like, process that Jughead was shirtless in this scene because I was just like, his hat's off. (laughs) Wow, I sure did notice that he was shirtless. I'm just going to say that and leave that there. (laughs) Uh, And, yeah, so he tells Archie the truth because randomly Archie shows up at school at 5 in the morning. (laughs) Okay, that was never explained either. There was never a scene where Jughead's like, Hey, like, I know why I'm here at 5.45 a.m. What about you? I, like, what was Archie... Do- was he just going to the music room to get, like, one last whiff of Miss Grundy? I, I think he was I, planning a picnic for Val. <laughs> and she's like, no, I sleep past six. Yeah, and uh, so we learned that um, Jughead's mom also sucks as a parent because she took Jelly Bean... And went to live with her grandparents. I just loved Jughead behind me raised by an unemployed drunk. Yeah, that was a little odd. Unless it was somehow Jughead's choice. And he's like, no, mom. Got a sweet gig at the drive-in. That's a really <laughs> stable job. Nothing will ever happen to it. I've got all I need. <laughs> an absentee father and 12 reels of Quentin Tarantino films. <laughs> and his, I've, don't worry, I've got all the friends I need in my cupboard. I've got... Huck Finn and Franz Kafka with me. He also has a mustache hat man. <laughs> Did you guys notice the no. on a chalkboard in the cupboard under the stairs, there is a drawing of a man with a hat and a mustache. And it's like a cartoon drawing. And I just really like the idea that this is Jughead's original art that he's decorating with. <laughs> All I was noticing was were the books that he had, and it was, of course, Metamorphosis yes. and stuff. Yeah. I noticed that too, but I paused so that I could show Kevin Mustache Hat Man. <laughs> it was really cute that Jughead's little suspenders were, like, hung up in the closet on a hook. I thought that was adorable. <laughs> uh, he's, he's committed to those suspenders. He will figure them out someday. Archie offers to have Jughead move in with him and Luke Perry, which I called before. You Um, did. I'm glad that this is happening, though. And then Jughead mentions, like, hey, don't tell Betty that I'm homeless. And Archie, being as quick on the driver, goes, why would she care? (laughs) (laughs) She's already been relegated to an afterthought by Archie, so he's like, like, what does she matter? You know who would really care about this, though? Veronica. Who I'm not into, by the way. I'm into Val, but Veronica. <laughs> I'm, I have thoughts about how she would think about this. It was classic Archie, so at least this character is consistent. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there's like a quick scene of Veronica getting back at her mother by shopping. Glamazon.com, which turns out is not a real website. Not that I was about to order everything from there. But. Yeah, it was a strange little cutaway scene to the Lodge family drama that seems pretty small in comparison to like a homeless child and a murder case. Is Veronica's like, it's called acting out mom. Have you ever heard of it? It's not a very subtle scene. There's one thing I really like about it, though, which is... Um, Hermione says, our nest egg can't cover all of this. And Mark goes, not even with your job, with your new boyfriend. Smithers, can you put those away for me? Their butler <laughs> is just, like, I want to know, like, how does their nest egg cover a butler? <laughs> the poor guy is probably on tenterhooks the whole time. He's like, oh, God, I'm going to get laid off any day now. <laughs> yes. Poor Smithers. And then, uh, so the River Gang, uh, the Riverdale Gang, no, I guess it's the River Gang now. I've, I've coined a new like portmanteau. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're just hanging out in the lounge, loudly discussing Polly's escape from an asylum and the destruction of Jason's car. <laughs> Veronica was my favorite in this scene for several reasons. First is, she asks what decade it is, and I think this was a sincere question. <laughs> <laughs> and until now, she thought it was like 1960. <laughs> 
<laughs> but also, no one responds to her in this scene. She has three lines. I watched. What decade is it? No one answers. And then she says, we should all move. And people just move on with the conversation. And then the very final thing in the scene, she's like, how can we help, Betty? And it just cuts away. <laughs> Veronica is the ghost now. Yes. Really, she always was. Yeah. Uh, I liked... Uh, so, Betty has... <laughs> A few good lines here. She says, Sheriff Keller says it's possible someone was lost. I'm like, yeah, you think? It's not one of those accidental stumble upon a car on a lost highway fire bombings. <laughs> and then she also asks, what if Polly is really hurt? How did you people miss the freaking blood on her window? She's definitely hurt. Like, we know that for a fact. Yes. Um, and this whole time, there's a random character standing in the background, like, listening in eagerly and texting someone about this. And we later learn that's Ginger texting Cheryl. It's like, really odd choice to not tell us who that was until way later, because I'd totally forgotten this character. She and Cheryl's other lackey are pretty much faceless, and they get, you know, like, they just kind of pass by them in shots, so I can't recognize them. I wouldn't know them if I ran into them with a truck. But it was just weird that they had this whole discussion about like, let's keep this a secret. Wouldn't want anyone to know that my sister escaped from a mental institution. <laughs> Ginger, did you hear that? My sister, <laughs> escapee, arson. <laughs> like high school students are not known at all for gossiping. <laughs> yeah, seriously, go into the blue and gold room. Talk about it at home after school. Anything but this. And Jughead <laughs> proves himself to be the most unsubtle shoulder groper of all time. And <laughs> so unsubtle that even Archie figures it out. <laughs> Archie, who previously asked a question about the car, who did burn it? As if someone had an answer. Um, <laughs> he figures this out. But Archie and Veronica gape at this shoulder touch like, you know, Jughead might as well just shoved his hand down the front of Betty's shirt at this point. Well, it's also that she holds his hand. Oh, yeah. That was cute, though. That was... I mean, I yeah. love it. It was a good moment. And then it's pretty much just like everyone's confronting the young lovers about this newfound liaison. Yeah. I like that Veronica, her first assumption is, wow, Jughead's such a creep. I can't believe he did that to you. And Ben's like, actually, we're really together. It's like, oh, my God, I totally approve. Best couple ever. It's like, wow, real 180 there, Veronica. <laughs> Oh my god, Swoon! <laughs> okay, in that case, if he helped my girl navigate some turbulent waters, well then, Veronica Lodge approves. Okay, did anyone else have kind of a weird feeling about how Betty responded to Veronica? Yes, I didn't really like that she just said, he's been really helping me through a hard time, rather than like, he's a hot, mysterious man that I'm into. But, okay, that was my exact thing of she kind of passed it off like, oh, no, like the last couple of days have been tough. You know, I'd had a few drinks. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. And I was like, no, like Jughead deserves better than that. And I, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a very Betty move. It was a little strange. But Archie's really cool about it with Jughead. So I don't think he feels backstabbed at all. Yeah, that's, that's the other reason why it's so weird. Like the backstabbing does not play at all in this episode. It's like, oh. Yeah, she she was like my third backup, so if I move through the others, then maybe I'll have a problem, but for now, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plenty of fish in the sea, Jughead, don't worry. Yeah, see, I feel like he thinks it's just casual at this point, and so he's not worried about it. Maybe. Are you saying this is going to become a point of conflict? No. <laughs> <laughs> see? <laughs> you are almost now... as bad a liar as Betty. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> Archie has no right to get upset over this. Because he's hardly spent time with Betty. He shot her down brutally and has moved on to several other women in front of her. So, Oh, he know. certainly has no right. But, you know. Here I was like, oh, wow, like Archie's kind of turning a corner here. He's really nice to Jughead about it. He's supportive. And then he's like, hey, I think I can talk to my dad about getting your dad's job back. So I was just starting to like Archie a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good episode for him, actually. He's a decent friend. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Um, and Cheryl's back. Growing yes. over the fact that she has vital information that will get her ungrounded. And everything that she says is absolute garbage, but she looks fantastic, and that's that's what's important here. Polly escaping plus Polly torching Jason's car equals she's Jason's killer. 
covering her tracks, trying to go underground, like the vicious, cold-hearted, murdering mean girl that she is. Oh, and I just tweeted this out to all of my minions, so the pressure's on, Sheriff Keller. I was really hoping that Sheriff Keller would take after his son and just vocally approve of Cheryl's wardrobe the whole time instead of having real dialogue. <laughs> I'm glad you said it, Sarah, because otherwise it would have been me creeping on her. But she looked fantastic. She shows up out of nowhere. The whole suspense of you're banned from cheerleading, which is the last thing we saw of Cheryl, she instantly gets that repealed within the first like 10 seconds she's on screen again. Yeah, I think we all called that back in episode, what was it, five? That it would go nowhere. It went nowhere. <laughs> yeah, like they just, like, hey, this could be a point of drama or like contention that maybe we can play up in one of our subplots. No, they squash that when she comes in. No, we'll, you can't we'll... use any real points of drama in this show. It's not allowed. <laughs> We're also introduced to the police station, which exists and is a real building with deputies and two stories and everything. Probably lockers for evidence. There definitely would have been room for a murder wall somewhere in that building. <laughs> yeah. Seems wild, but yeah. Cheryl busts in and she sort of does this, this chain of events that doesn't make a lot of sense where she's like, I've got information that you guys are going to want to know, but I'm not going to tell you until after you let me do cheerleading again. And when her mom gives in, she's like, Polly broke out. Also, I already tweeted this, so you didn't have to give into my blackmail. You could have just looked at my Twitter. Uh, <laughs> You're really honestly, bad at though, blackmail, Cheryl. <laughs> so bad. But really, every single person in this town appears to be doing more police work than Sheriff Keller. Like, at this point, just start up a volunteer sheriff's department and get rid of him entirely. Yeah. What is even the point? Terrible. Yeah, he starts out in this scene with like, Miss Blossom, we're this close to cracking right. the case. And I'm Except like, I have no information. <laughs> but we're right there. <laughs> I, I will have more to say about Sheriff Keller's contributions to the police work of Riverdale later on. But suffice it to say, oh, there are notes. <laughs> yes. Um, so as soon as this gets tweeted out, it... Everyone at school already knows because they're all following Cheryl re religiously. And her use of hashtags was strange. It's monstrous. You guys, oh my god. What? Cheryl just tweeted, hashtag Polly Cooper killed my brother. Hashtag nowhere to hide. Hashtag sharpen your pitchforks. Hashtags on Twitter are designed for things that are trending. But at the same time, I feel like few people use them anymore. I don't see how... Polly Cooper killed my brother would be a trending hashtag since it really only applies to one person. <laughs> it would have been made more sense if she was like, Polly Cooper killed my brother, hashtag like Jason Blossom murder. Like if that was a thing people were following or paying attention to in the news. Yes. Um, yeah. And so we learn about that and we leave that riveting drama of a mob being stirred up against Polly to have Jughead return to his trailer home to ask his dad to work at a construction company. Just riveting the heights <laughs> of drama here. Here's the thing from Jughead opening the door to come in to Jughead closing the door to leave is one minute and 19 seconds. And I'm like, who stops by to see their family for one minute and 19 seconds? People with ideal lives, Hunter. <laughs> with that dad, like... that sounds like a generous amount of time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the trailer just needs a little bit of work, like a splash of paint, a couple of throw pillows. <laughs> then FP, which is confusing to me because this character's called FP, and in all my notes, I abbreviate <laughs> Luke Perry as LP. Yes, I have the same note. Oh no, we have FP and Luke Perry, and we can't just... <laughs> call luke perry by his character's name we're not monsters yeah so fp brings up the prodigal son parable and calls jughead the prodigal son but wasn't that thing like in the bible the prodigal son comes back and the dad's really happy and welcoming <laughs> yes yes <laughs> Isn't that the whole point of it? So I, Also, I guess... the prodigal son, I believe the dad has his shit together, and it's the son who needs work, and that's clearly not how this relationship works. And the no. dad had, like, given the son money to go out into the world, which I, I just don't get the feeling that Jughead got a lot of financial support from his father while he was living in an abandoned drive-in. 
What I believe is that at most, FP gave him like a half finished off flask and is like, here you go, son. It's all I've got in this world. <laughs> and when you finish that, could you bring the flask back? <laughs> I kind of need it. Um, yeah, it's worth, I think it's worth calling out. FP goes through this whole episode with like the most sunken, like red eyes. Like he looks like he's on meth the whole episode. It's weird. Oh, okay. I didn't remember that Skeet Ulrich was in Scream until you brought it up last episode, Sarah. And I looked up pictures of him in Scream, and he's nearly unrecognizable with like how skeletal and creepy they make him look in this show. Yeah, he was a very handsome man. Like I remember, you know, those of us who were watching the film at the time thinking like, oh, sure, he's a murderer, but so cute. <laughs> As one does. <laughs> I think that's the whole uh, reason behind Riverdale casting, too. Like, ah, cute murderers. Yeah. yeah. Jughead, they kind of give him, like, shadowy, like, bags under his eyes, which I think they've lessened up on as the series progressed. But they really hammered it home with FP. Like, they just make him look like a homogenous mass of Florida males. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's a little overboard. But it does get across that he's a mess. Yes. Everything about FP gets across that he's a mess. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> then we have the mass organized hunt for Polly. Which, have... of course, like most search parties, is 90% teenagers. I have <laughs> so many notes on this scene. It's it's please incredible. <laughs> I've got some, but please go on. I want to hear your take on this wonderful scene. All right. So quickly, Archie apologizes to Betty for being self-absorbed, which, you know, good for Archie. But more importantly, Veronica, in the middle of this search to find her best friend's missing sister, shares her plans to go clubbing during the weeknight and not invite her best friend along. She's going to invite her best gay, Kevin, a local celebrity, Josie, and uh, some, what was it? Some dumb meat candy? Uh, Which is Reggie. Dim-witted, sexy, disposable arm candy. Which which is is reductive because Reggie's not disposable. (laughs) He he also has a great moment there when they're looking at him as like, oh, he'll be good. He is taking like a faked crying selfie in the forest. <laughs> yeah, and so I weird. love it. Like that's such an odd but perfect choice. I feel like the actor came up with that because it's, it's too good for the Riverdale writers. Yes, absolutely. He has so much personality and I feel like it's really the actor coming through with this where like he's making things that would otherwise not work at all kind of play pretty well i also like that kevin like briefly tries to like pretend like he knows what he's doing in the forest he pulls out a compass spins it around in his hand a few times then just puts it away and <laughs> shrugs yeah <laughs> i noticed that. i'm like my dude it points north it ain't that complicated <laughs> and they're just walking in a line in one yeah. direction what did he need the compass for they're not lost <laughs> I also really like uh, V mentions her, uh, Veronica mentions her fave celebrity gal pal, which I assume is Tara Reid. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if I was Veronica, that's what I would mean. Importantly, to finally redeem myself for my past fashion misses, I took a lot of notes on fashion in this scene. Betty's mom brings a designer purse to scour the woods with. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Cheryl shows up in like... An old-timey, like, English hunter's outfit. <laughs> like fox hunting gear? Yes, and and Kevin really dropped the ball here because he did not vocally approve of, his, of her wardrobe. So, like, that's half of his character development gone in an instant. <laughs> and everyone is wearing wildly out-of-date hat wear. Mr. Blossom has a derby cap. Mrs. Blossom has a cloche hat from the 20s, and the deputies all have Stetsons with badges sewn into the front. And don't forget Ver- Veronica's designer beret from the 60s. Oh yeah, she's not dressed for the woods. Um, I think possibly my favorite part of this scene is the very opening where they're standing in front of this misty for boating forest and betty's like if she left she would have gone right through here yep <laughs> straight through bear claw forest down into dead drop gulch across the river at boulder death rapids and then boom she's only 19 miles from the dirt logging road straight toward the abandoned gravel pits <laughs> well you really did your map research <laughs> i was just like no one would run through this this is like the most impassable terrain there is <laughs> 
It's also called Ever's Green Forest. Like they just were like, oh, it's got a lot of evergreens. But wait, we can't just call it that. Had an S in there. <laughs> got it. Yeah, no maple trees. I don't think I've seen a single maple tree in this forest, so I don't know where they're getting all the syrup from. <laughs> well, yeah, it's filmed in Vancouver, so not as many maple trees there. Yeah, so the search party that Betty organized runs into Cheryl's, like, fugitive slave catchers who have, like, <laughs> baying coon hounds and, like, southern-looking deputy sheriffs in a North New England county. <laughs> when we find her, we're gonna give her to the gimp. Make damn sure she suffers. <laughs> Like, I like that the boss- Blossoms can round up their own posse, but Sheriff Keller can only scrounge up, like, two additional deputies to help out. <laughs> he appears to be the only police officer in this town. Uh, I think Penelope rolls up, and she's like, oh, yeah, like, we're gonna catch Polly. She's guilty. I know it. Sheriff Keller knows it. And he, like, looks up, and he's like, what? No, no. <laughs> I don't I don't know anything. <laughs> Yeah, he tries. He tries to be impartial, and everyone just like sides him. Like, shut up! You have nothing to do with this. And he's like, "Aw, but they're right. <laughs> You'll arrest who we tell you to arrest." <laughs> and he just goes back to like playing mobile poker on his phone. <laughs> and uh, so after that confrontation, Alice actually does something that I really enjoyed. She very sadly holds a press conference reveals that Polly was pregnant with Jason's baby and says, like, this proves her innocence. And I just love that we know she's a newswoman, but we actually got to see, like, how well she can manipulate the media. And I loved it. When she found out about the murder, she was beside herself with grief. You see, my daughter, Polly, is pregnant with Jason Blossom's baby. Oh, yeah, she was really good in this scene. She was great. And before that scene, we got some more CoverGirl product placement with the All Day Stay Foundation, <laughs> leading to me to believe that this entire show is just an elaborate CoverGirl ad. I <laughs> missed that on both watches. I, I'm i slipping. Yeah. I, I saw there was some product placement, but the label was upside down. Like, I'm not pausing to figure this one out. <laughs> but there's Sarah a, did. There's a lot of very weird makeup application in this show. Like, just... Out of nowhere, people are like, oh, I know what I need to do. Mascara. In situations where, you know, like, do that at home. What are you doing? Yeah, she's putting on mascara in a church and she's like, let's see the blossoms. <laughs> Check this. We're in front of a holy house and we'll reveal our daughter's illicit relationship with their son. They'll be <laughs> they'll be putty in the palm of our hands. It's so good. <laughs> and then as soon as it's announced, because no one but the blossoms and Jughead seem to know, uh, Cheryl gets really upset because I guess she's super jealous that she's not the pregnant one. <laughs> Clearly. Since Polly was locked up in this home, does this rule her out as a murder suspect or are the Blossoms just covering up the fact that she is the killer? I believe she's not a murder suspect. She seemed really shocked to learn of Jason's death. And like barring like a dissociative fugue state, like it seems likely that she really didn't know because she was trapped in that asylum for months it seems like an easy thing to do would be to just ask the nuns at that asylum hey was there ever a time where she went missing before and then if they say no case closed (laughs) yeah nuns are not allowed to lie so actually i pretty much trust them it's also not like her recent sneaking out was subtle she crashed through a window (laughs) right (laughs) like they would probably remember that i think the other thing was Cheryl earlier in the police station is like, oh, like, she, of course, waited till now to burn the car of the evidence. If she was the one who killed Jason and she was any sort of competent killer, then she would have, you know, murdered Jason and then burned the car immediately instead of waiting months to do so. Yes. Yeah. So it just stands to reason that whoever burned the car didn't know it existed until they followed Jughead and Betty and found it. Yeah. So I'm ruling Polly out as a murder suspect officially in, on my murder board, which is taking up most of the wall in front of me. <laughs> and so uh, after that failed search party, Juggy walks Betty home so they can make out more. And in a wild reversal from the norm, 
Betty has a revelation and then kisses Jughead. <laughs> uh, yes, usually she kisses him and then has some sort of thunderbolt moment. And he, I think he's just like, how long can I keep this up? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta start saying more insightful things. <laughs> and uh, so she figures out that Polly, the last time she ran away, just was up in their home attic. And it's like, it feels like you should have remembered that a little sooner. <laughs> um, and yeah, Polly is there living her best life as a jump scare. Um, <laughs> Can we talk about the attic? Yes. When the, okay, Sarah, you are chomping at the bit. It's the creepiest attic of all time. Like, there are definitely bodies in the floorboards of this attic. There are, there are bodies in the crawl spaces. There's just, it's it's a terrifying attic. So, Kevin, I know you're a Joss Whedon fan. I assume you've seen Cabin in the Woods. Of course. And there's that one scene before the haunting begins where they kind of like, they find a basement and it's just filled with like 14 different haunted artifacts. Yeah, there's just hundreds everywhere. Like, anything they pick up is gonna unleash a monster. That's what this attic is. There's, like, a Ouija board. There's dolls. There's an old wedding dress. There's, like, a soldier's uniform. Everything in there is fucking terrifying. (laughs) Yes. I mean, the Coopers are on that murder board for a reason. Yeah, and Polly comes out and just, like, in the totally normal way that you greet your sister of covering her mouth and dragging her back into the darkness <laughs> while being like, shh, shh, shh. I really wanted her to be wearing a wedding dress. I thought that would have been a great touch. Sadly, no. We find out that she snuck in there, no problem, though. So that puts her one up on Archie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also see that her wound is like, it's like a scratch. <laughs> It, she's been fine. It's gone on unbandaged for like three days, and she's like, "Oh, this, <laughs> oh, this old thing." Yeah, I can barely any barely see any tendons in there. <laughs> but uh, they have a good talk about Polly wanting to keep the baby and how she doesn't trust their parents. And then the next morning, Betty's like, "Hey, so Polly keep the baby, right?" And her parents are like, "Ha ha ha! No, she's giving it up. She told us." <laughs> yeah that was another great scene for alice cooper because she is just like stone cold relentless take charge of the situation she's like nope not gonna have that thing in my house <laughs> she is the all-star of the series she's great but okay there was a little bit with polly in the attic where they polly talks about the adoption and says so she doesn't want to give her kid up. And she has some line like, I won't have my baby raised in a home that doesn't want it. And the first time I watched the episode, I'm like, you're not clear on how adoption works. Like, they're not forced <laughs> to have the baby. Right. But, but then I think she meant like, oh, like, if I was allowed to keep the baby, I don't want to raise it here because our parents are psychos and want me to give it up. Which I definitely think that's what she means. Clearly, the Coopers do not want this baby. Sarah, you found a good thing. Oh, the... (laughs) So, uh, Hal is reading the newspaper, and on the back is an ad for the Riverdale Food Co-op, which just adds a lot of depth to this town. (laughs) And also reveals the source of the local Munster. (laughs) Finally. All right, so... uh... Every once in a while, late at night, I can't sleep. You know, the weight of the world's on my shoulders. Like, I'm kept up by terrifying thoughts of how climate change is going to doom us all. But as I was kept up late last night, a more important thought popped in my head, which is, wait a minute, Hal and Alice are the people who run the local newspaper. Hal is reading the newspaper he put together? (laughs) Well, you've done it again, Hal. (laughs) Another great weather report. That storm really is blowing in in two to three days. Oh. I don't know. Is he reading the competition? It's it's. How so... could a local newspaper? How could a local town support two newspapers? Though there are major cities that can't support one newspaper right now. Okay, it's true. I guess he's yeah. He's a little bit self-centered. So maybe this is a subtle sign of his narcissism which is one of the key elements of a serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to believe the, the title of the newspaper is just S- Shara Blossom, Still Guilty as Sin, Part 53 of our 450-part series. 
<laughs> it's just an expose on her missing the last four River Vixens pra- uh, practices. Yeah. The sad white girl twerk has gotten even sadder. <laughs> <laughs> These are oh. desperate times. All right. So before we get into the next section, I've got to say, like, this is where the episode starts to really fall apart because the main cast gets really atomized. Everyone kind of spins off on their own. And it's all intercut a lot, but everyone's doing their own thing and none of it relates to each other. And it's a mess. So I tried to put this outline together as best I could, globbing together the sections that are actually relevant. Uh, But man, it's rough when the main cast is all separated and doing their own thing. Who is the main character of Riverdale? I mean, you would want to say Archie, but I don't, I can't say with any confidence that he's the main character. It's in terms of like who's driving the plot, it's Betty and Jughead, but in who gets the most screen time, it is Archie, which is kind of weird. Hey, you know, who am I to question greatness when this show is now in its fourth season and seems to have a solid fan base? (laughs) Yeah, I think they're trying to do an ensemble type show where there is no main character. But if you do that, you need to make all of your characters really dynamic and interesting. And they need to interact a lot. Yeah, there needs to be uh, really fun interactions and really interesting relationships between all of your characters. None of that's going on here. Like, in the show Friends, there aren't episodes where, like, every character goes off and does their own thing. They're always in little groups together. Mm Mm-hmm. We just have some stuff where characters seem to disappear or, hey, like, let's try and build a B-plot for Veronica, but it fizzles. And maybe that's because she so seldom interacts with anyone else who's a really substantial character. Well, that's also the problem with this episode. So, like you said, Hunter, normally stories have A and B-plots. There's, like, a main thread and then, like, a secondary thread that people can jump through. But because, because all of the characters are separated... They all have their own plots, and none is really taking precedence. So it's like there are four A plots that are all the equivalent of a B plot. Mm -hmm. But I think we were getting to your favorite of all our A plots, uh, FP working with Luke Perry again, and all the beautiful drama that erupts from there. Yeah, there is some history there. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I mean, FP does take Jughead's advice and walks in to Luke Perry's office and comments on how nice it is. I wanted Luke Perry to be, like, frantically stuffing, like, Hermione's underwear into a drawer. <laughs> and, like, oh, these are all mine from home. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so FP takes his job back, and Luke Perry introduces FP and Hermione, and then does what I think any of us would do in that situation, answers a random phone call and walks out of the office. (laughs) (laughs) And we have another thing about stepping on snakes here. Everyone's so (laughs) horned up over snake stepping in this show. Because FP is saying like, oh, one thing about snakes, Hermione, if you don't step on them, they don't have a reason to bite you. I was like, he's just stealing Veronica's lines, basically, at this point. (laughs) He's like, damn it, that was such a good line. I've got to remember that. Like, just get a Don't Tread on Me shirt and just leave it alone. (laughs) (laughs) He just has that flag tattooed on him. Yes. (laughs) Here's the thing about snakes. They're cold-blooded creatures who either lay eggs or give birth to live young, depending on the species. (laughs) I would love if FP, his his character arc is just interesting animal facts on t-shirts. <laughs> he yes. started the Southside Serpents because he was an amateur herpetologist and he just... <laughs> I like that in this scene, FP has on red flannel and Luke Perry has on blue flannel, which I'm going to take as subtle symbolism because this show is known for that. <laughs> Wait, but what does that symbolize? That Good they wear bad. different flannel. <laughs> is, this like a, is this a political thing? <laughs> no, I was just taking it as like, you know, like the the red devil evil and then the blue good angelic whatever. Yeah, I mean, the, all those things are perfect descriptors of Luke Perry. <laughs> and then, so after that, that just kind of ends. And a day later, uh, Luke Perry and FP finished their first successful day together. And so they're like, well, time to prematurely celebrate. Let's go to Pops. <laughs> Wait, 
So they went to Pops because I was really curious when they suggested dinner where they might go. I thought they might choose the new Italian place that just opened up down the block. <laughs> that would make sense. But no, I, I guess that FP is a real traditionalist. He wants Pops. And they engage in some ultra appropriate conversation by talking about the band they had together and their shagging wagon. <laughs> yeah. Remember what we called it, Fred? The Shaggin' the shaggin wagon. wagon! The Shaggin' Wagon. Which is definitely something I, as a teen boy, would want to know about my parents. <laughs> okay, um, so I know that you said Fred Heads might be a reference, but it's a terrible band name. Can we just get that out of the way? <laughs> yeah, it's bad. I assumed it was just a reference to Dead Heads. So we learn here that FP has never heard of Betty before. Which is very strange because Jughead, Archie, and Betty are childhood best friends. So You would think if he and Luke Perry were working together, and he would have been over by the house and be like, Oh, like Betty? You mean like the Cooper girl who was mm-hmm. next door to the Andrews? Like They could have had a simple line like that. Like, oh, I haven't seen right. her in a while. But he's <laughs> never heard of her and immediately wants to date her. So. Yeah, <laughs> FP is way too into the idea of Betty. Yeah. Yeah, Jughead works on a school paper with Betty. Betty? Ooh. Who is Betty? Is that your girlfriend? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, he gets pretty horned up over the idea. But I did like that Jughead got, like, kind of bashful and steered the conversation away from that because that felt like a very real teenage thing. And I think a lot of Jughead's actions in this episode are very real to me. Yes, I think he does a really good job in this episode. I did really enjoy the way that he changed the conversation topic, which reminded me of the Smarter Child bot from like (laughs) 2001, which you two may not remember, but it was a very primitive bot on AOL, on AIM. And it would just like try to like have a conversation with you, but it was very bad at it. So it would be like, oh, is this related to the liking bands? And that is how Jughead sounded. (laughs) I want to talk about the musical things with bands. Tell me more. (laughs) I liked it because I was like, okay, when I was that age and if my dad asked me about a girl or something, then I would have probably done the same thing and gotten really nervous. Oh, yeah. That's actually still how I handle interaction with my parents. Like, ah, so you're still dating Sarah. Dad, not so loud. People can hear you. (laughs) Mine, by now, have just been like, oh no, he's an Archie. (laughs) And then, so that scene ends with FP awkwardly insisting on paying and, like, being very sinister about it. Yeah. Yeah, like, really aggressive and kind of having, like, okay, this guy has some mental issues that were either aggravated or brought on by substance abuse. I also like that Luke Perry is like, oh, if I'd known you were paying, I I would have ordered a milkshake. And it's like, you did. They offered to treat. That's how you guys came out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But this is where Betty comes clean to Veronica about the fact that Polly's living in the attic. And Veronica's like, hey, I want to help out. Uh, Betty brings up like, hey, my sister actually needs medical attention despite the gash on her leg. She's also several months pregnant. Yeah, yeah. And then Cheryl butts in to offer to help, and they quickly move the conversation to a side room that was available the whole time to not be overheard in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Cheryl is obsessed with the baby, which is not weird at all, and she is definitely not like, this is the baby I always wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's more of that later. It's really weird. But, I mean, Cheryl tries to be pretty good in this episode, and I think... The last couple times we've seen her, we've seen a lot more character development from her, and she's not wholly evil. She's not. She's she's definitely um, deeply, deeply flawed, but she does have her redeeming qualities. Yes. Mostly those thigh-high boots. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, Betty turns all of them down for help. It's like, nope, don't need you guys. Get out of here. I mean, she seems at least interested in cheryl's offer of hey my family has a lot of money your sister needs money because she needs to go to a doctor and it seems like that's going somewhere well that could actually be left over from the fact that in the first draft of the script betty actually accepted cheryl's help and asked her to take 
Polly to the doctor for an appointment. Oh, really? I oh, interesting. Did. It's I felt like there was something missing from this episode, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Yeah, well, so they actually filmed this scene, but sadly it had to be cut for time. But uh, thank you to the uh, searchers in the Riverdale fan community who have unearthed this. Uh, we can actually show this uh, deleted scene. Trust your new sis, Share Bear Polly. This is the best doctor in town. That's why I brought you to her clinic. This isn't a medical clinic, though. It's it's just an attic in Thornhill. Okay, but at least it's the best attic, the autumn attic. Plus, maybe I just thought you'd feel safer locked in another attic. You adorable little Bertha Mason, you. But who could possibly be meeting us here? Well, dearies, the doctor is in. Nana Rose? You're a doctor? Oh, Polly, my dear, I'm the best there is. I was trained by the famous Dr. Livingston. You know, he told me I could call him David if I presumed. And oh my, girls, I presumed. I presumed two or three times a night. Ew, Nana. Hush, that was long before I met your grandfather. I even treated David in his final days. It was a cool May day in northern Rhodesia. 1873, I think it was. David was racked with malaria and had just suffered another bout of internal bleeding from the dysentery. You know what, Cheryl? I think I'm good. Look, she's who my brother would have wanted you to see. Who better to take care of JJ's baby than my Nene? Besides, any other doctor would call the popo on the most famous Riverdale runaway slash murder suspect as soon as he walked in. Sadly, by then, he didn't seem to be breathing anymore, so Juma and Susie and I cut out his heart and buried it under the nearest baobab tree. It's what David would have wanted. Uh, my heart's fine where it is, Nana Rose. Um, uh, and I don't think I need heart surgery. Are, are you a gyno or an obstetrician? Obstetrics, of course. I learned to perform caesareans while visiting the people of the Great Lakes of Africa after David's sad demise. The healers who performed them there were surprisingly advanced medical practitioners for being negroids. Wow, we are going to have a long talk about your distressing unwokeness after this is over. But for now, she doesn't need a C-section, Nana. She just needs vitamins, a physical, and maybe some diet tips. Yes, definitely some diet tips. I'm pregnant, Cheryl, not fat. That's the spirit, Paul. Imagine your way to a successful slim down. Oh, of course. Here, I have several tinctures of laudanum that should be good. Remember to take no more than a penny weight a day to ensure the baby gets the right daily intake of opium. Okay, you were right, Polly. This was a mistake. Hashtag Nana's Bananas. Let's just put you back in your own attic, and I'll slip you a couple cases of Flintstones vitamins before we get back in there. Thank you, Cheryl. I truly believe this is the kindest thing you've ever done for anyone. So yeah, we learned quite a bit of Nana Rose's backstory. I, Sarah, you had really hit the mark with your guess back in episode five that Nana Rose had helped to colonize Africa. She just really gives off that vibe, you know? Yeah, yeah. I had no idea, but I think that Cheryl's dialogue here was just as powerful and uh, thematic as it ever was. I can't believe that they cut such an amazing and intense scene. Well, I think you can kind of tell from how, from uh, the sound quality a bit that uh, both Nana Rose and Polly had colds or something that day because for some reason they sound like two 30-year-old men, but... <laughs> Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know if Nana Rose was British in the first episode, but it seems like she is now. It yeah. comes and goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we go to Veronica's clubbing plot, and I have tiled this section three quarters of the way to a perfect Riverdale cast <laughs> because we've got Josie, we've got Kevin, we've got Reggie, but then we've got Veronica. <laughs> so close. Oh, okay, Veronica's lines in this scene are the worst in the episode. She blows Cheryl out of the water entirely here. <laughs> First of all, this is a very fancy club that does not make sense in Riverdale <laughs> at all. This is <laughs> this is a town with one restaurant, and yet there is a club that looks like an incredible big city. It's nicer than most clubs I've ever been to, and... It's banging on a weeknight in a town of 12 people where eight of them are high school sophomores. <laughs> it looks like that, like the beginning of Blade right before Wesley Snipes walks in. And <laughs> it's just like, where does this, how, how far did they have to go to get to this club? 
I don't understand this. They but... must not go very far because Josie has a line in the club that she can call her mother the mayor. So they're still in they Riverdale. They are in Riverdale. Oh and my gosh. This is such a fancy, nice place. And yet they are serving 15 year olds, which no respectable establishment would. Most clubs are 21 plus with the weird exception of those 18 plus clubs that kids in like my freshman year of college would try to promote. So the fact that they're in there at all doesn't make any sense. Right. A sketchy, you know, dive bar, maybe you could get away with not having your ID checked, but this is a nice place. Why would they risk that? Yeah. And it's also a little weird because I get how Veronica's able to go out clubbing on school night. She has that scene with Hermione. She's like, I've got all the cards. You have to apologize to me to make the stop. But how are Josie, Kevin, and Reggie able to come to? Like, <laughs> Sheriff Keller seems like he's pretty chill about his son, but not that chill. And Josie and her parents are definitely not okay with this type of behavior. They have zero chill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, who knows? May- maybe Miles actually called to let Josie in a club. Is like, look, underage drinking and partying on a school night is how you keep your music real. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the real jazz heads would do. You got to get like them, uh, get hooked on heroin. Hit up Nana Rose. If you don't have a drug overdose by 27, you've basically sold out, (laughs) Josie. Uh, Are they supposed to be drunk in this scene? I, that's the implication I felt like was coming across, but they're, I don't know. Maybe this is like a problem with network standards because it's very unclear Maybe they couldn't show what was supposed to be underage drinking, but it does seem to be played that they are drunk. Would the threat of calling the mayor be a thing if they weren't drinking? Mm-hmm. True, because yeah. that's what I thought. The music when they're dancing on the dance floor in the club, the lyrics mention getting drunk and just the way they're acting. I was like, I'm pretty sure they're supposed to be inebriated, but I wanted to double check with you guys before I just went on record with like, oh, they're hammered. Yeah, there's there's a quick dance scene which kind of implies it, especially because like the last dance move they all do is just like a group hug, jump up and down. And that seems like something that's not going to happen unless everyone is a little bit hammered. That's just how I greet my friends, typically. <laughs> I was wondering why you always carry around that boombox with all the like blasting synth and techno. But Veronica then monologues and it's I think it's the worst dialogue ever. Veronica's dialogue in this scene is really, really questionable. Uh, she, I don't think it was necessary to invent this complaint about, uh, oh, I can't believe my mom took my name from me because like she committed fraud. I feel like that's in and of itself enough of a complaint. And normally people use the expression, she took my name to mean, oh, we got married, not, oh, she stole my identity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the whole everything about it when they were like oh they took our houses and our yacht and everyone's rolling their eyes and reggie's making jokes i don't know like veronica the feel the joke. room <laughs> yes because there was one thing in this world that no one could ever take from me not ever your trust fund also again your parent can sign for you if you're 15 years old this isn't a thing this is a made-up thing you're a minor. So it was yeah. more manufactured drama that like, I'm not that interested in the Lodge family goings on. I'm, no. There are a lot of other things that I think are way more important we should be focused on. Like how Veronica's American excess card gets declined. <laughs> but she brought enough cash. She just has a wad of $100 bills. She's terrible at being poor. <laughs> I, I really want to know exactly how much their nest egg is. <laughs> like, maybe Hermione Lodge is like um, <laughs> is like Mrs. Bluth in Arrested Development, where she just has no idea how much things cost. She's like, oh, we've only got $10 million. That won't last us a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's something like that. Because, yeah, like, they have a butler, they have a wonderful place, and they just apparently have cash to throw around when they are out clubbing. So, I don't... It's... It's bizarre to say the least. Yes, like most people in 2017, she has a lot of cash on her. <laughs> yes. As is typical. Yeah, that poor club owner, though, because, like, hey, your card was declined. I-, I think I have to call the police. And they, like, browbeat him to switch. Like, guys, I'm, like, a minimum wage bartender. I don't care. <laughs> like, just please don't make my job hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all flip out. I'm like, I'm Veronica Lodge. My mom's a mayor. Yeah, sure, call the cops. We'll be happy to tell them how old we are. Oh, or I could call my mom the mayor. (laughs) He's like, 
cool. Can I get the money, though? <laughs> yeah. You guys drank, like, three bottles of Absolute back here. <laughs> Are you going to tip me or what? <laughs> no tip. Just, just nothing. All right, fine. Yeah. But yeah, so with that card being declined, Veronica realizes that her mother is has quote-unquote blinked, so she goes back home to extract an apology, saying, this is how we lodge em, women operate. We faint, we parry, and I wanted to be like, and not just parry, but Luke parry. <laughs> yes. I think from here we cross cut or smash Hold cut on. over. Oh. We have to say goodbye to Reggie. This is his <gasps> last scene in the series. Wait, was his last line really just him saying, oh, your trust fund? No, no. His last line was, we'd be happy to let the police know how old we are. Which is really a strong line to go out on, I feel. I didn't know, like, I didn't know this is the last time we get to see Reggie. Well, I mean, the character will come back, it's recast in season two, but this is our last time with Ross Butler, and I think we can all say, like, he was one of our favorites. Yes, absolutely. I just, I felt moved. We had to pay tribute to this character. You put together a very moving and beautiful memorial, which I will play now for the folks at home. If we could just have a moment of silence. <laughs> I'm definitely crying. <laughs> I'm taking a crying selfie for the gram right now. <laughs> R.I.P. in peace. But yeah, so that last one, there was actually a deleted scene filmed with him for the 13th episode. And I can't believe they cut it. Um, Why do they Hunter, keep doing this? All the best you, scenes get cut from this show. Do you have that scene to play too? Because oh my god, it's so good. I got this queued up. Reggie's final scene. Ooh, damn, Polly. As if I didn't already have mommy issues. Welcome back. You are looking good. Thanks, Reggie. Beat it, you pig. Oh, I will. Later. And I will be thinking of you, Mama. It's it's beautiful. Why? Why would they get rid of that? <laughs> like, why would they get rid of the blatant sexual harassment and perversion that we've come to know and love? <laughs> I like that it shows that Reggie's character had made zero growth from episode one of Did You Tap Some Cougar Ass and Spank Bank to episode 13 where he's like, hey, gonna jack off to you. Yeah, that's it's interesting that a 15-year-old has a pregnancy fetish. Um... That's quite a choice. <laughs> Everything about that was strange. I, you know, I take it back. Maybe this was a good decision to cut this scene so we could remember Reggie for what he was. He's a simple, beautiful man. Uh, Sexy, beautiful arm candy. I don't know who's stepping in and when they recast Reggie, but they've got some big shoes to fill. They do. So let's go from that to uh, FP and Archie are jamming together. And FP declares Archie to be super talented before immediately switching tracks and talking about how Luke Perry screwed him out of the Andrews construction par uh, partnership that he had. So I took some odd jobs. They weren't exactly on the level. And sure enough, one of them landed me in some hot water. And your dad was, well, he was good enough to bail me out. Then he said we should part ways, that I was a liability. Made me sign a paper saying that the bail money was him buying me out of the company. You're a lot better at guitar than your dad, who's a thief. <laughs> yeah, FP has like a great line where he says like, oh, your dad just had you and your mom to provide for, but I, I had my wife and Jug had Jellybean. That's, that's one more person, FP. Like, I don't, I don't know if you can count, but. <laughs> <laughs> Not that big a difference. Suffice to say, the minute I saw this, I, my first thought was FP's version of events deserves some scrutiny. Yeah, but he, he did some stuff that was illegal, which is probably true given what he does now. And Luke Perry bailed him out of jail, but made him sign a contract saying that the bailout money 
was him buying FP out of his partnership, which is a really bad move from a business standpoint on Luke Perry's part. Like, he clearly should have murdered FP. That's how you gain control of a company. Has he learned nothing from the Blossoms? Yeah, but it's not a maple syrup business, so... Also, I mean, FP is acting like he didn't have a choice, but he could have just not signed that and not taken bail money. That would also have been a thing he could have done. He had options, so that's why... I'm not exactly on his side. No, it's pretty easy not to be on his side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although Archie seems pretty well convinced and he's like gets all moody with Luke Perry and is like, why'd you do that? Yeah, he it's it's a little sweet because it seems to be motivated out of concern for the fact that Jughead got screwed over inadvertently too. Um, so at least he's being a good friend, but you know, he could be a little more charitable. Like, why didn't you stick up for your felonious friend, Dad? Archie just sways with the wind here. Whatever is the last thing he heard is the thing that he believes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Archie. And then Jughead and his dad go home after Jughead hides the flask. Not a euphemism. A thing he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, at home, Jughead relates a cute story about Jellybean, but FP's already passed out, so he doesn't hear any of it. Also, JB sounds amazing. Jughead's living in the X-Files. He wants to believe that his dad is going to turn out okay and he wants the family to be back together. They were really well written and good scenes for Jughead in this yeah. episode. And Cole Sprouse does a really great job, I think. I'm a little confused, though, because here we learn that Jellybean is 10 years old, even though, like, we saw a picture of her and Jughead together two episodes ago, three episodes ago, and they looked to be about the same age, like, five or six years ago. So I don't know what happened. I hope she does show up on this show, though, because she sounds really cool. She could recommend all her best Pink Floyd songs to us. She'd be like, you only like money. Let me introduce you to When the Tigers Break Free. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we need like a 10 year old pitchfork snob in the show. That's what we've been missing out on. Let me explain all the subtleties of the wall movie to you. Do you know the independent animation studio they hired? I've got so many of these. I looked up a lot of Pink Floyd facts for these jokes. Please let these jokes land. (laughs) How much time did you spend on the Pink Floyd Wikipedia page? Sarah is walking out of our recording space. She is composing herself and she is coming back. I think our relationship will survive for another day. Did you have any more Pink Floyd facts that you really needed to get off your chest? No, I actually don't know that much about Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Betty ends up meeting with the Blossoms, and I'll give you three guesses as to where they all meet up. Uh, it's probably at the new Sodale construction site in the pouring rain. No, 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 that was close, but uh, uh, not the student it. student lounge. Uh, wow, that's a good guess because a lot of people end up there, but no, believe it or not, they actually meet at Puffs. Oh, oh interesting. <laughs> Uh, that's a really underutilized location i don't know how we were expected to guess that that was kind of a tough one but we most importantly we learned that mr blossom is definitely wearing a wig (laughs) for sure that can't be real hair like (laughs) i'm not crazy am i uh uh, it could be real hair but like everyone in riverdale seems to have a bad dye job (laughs) i feel like it's not real hair i couldn't pay attention to much else so even like Mrs. Blossom being really manipulative in this scene fell by the wayside for me. Oh yeah, she says like, we just want to offer Polly all the emotional support we can. And I was like, yes, we've seen how emotionally supportive the family is. They'll let Veronica handle it while they sit on the bleachers. The baby's crib is going to be a converted Iron Maiden. <laughs> and then they'll be at dinner. It'll be like, oh, you're six months old. Learn how to handle your silverware. <laughs> And you're not allowed to leave this table until you finish every last bite of that maple (laughs) ham. They'll just have her sleep in one of the caskets they have ready to go (laughs) for the next person to enter the graveyard. (laughs) (laughs) This baby has no useful opinions on the uh, Obama administration's Iran nuclear deal. I don't know why we let it in the (laughs) house. She can't even trap a tree yet. She's useless. Yeah. (laughs) I was just like, that's the worst environment for any child. So no matter what, do not let another kid be raised in the Blossom. Yeah, manner. and of course we learned later that, like, of course this was all a ploy. Like, they're they're so ready to get Polly out of the picture so they can have the baby for themselves. Oh, have you ever seen her do drugs? <laughs> Is she on the crack, as the kids call it? 
Oh, yeah. I love asking, like, oh, is Polly a party girl? Like, she looks like she's maybe been to a party one time by accident. <laughs> like, like, clearly, she's not a party girl. She looks like a kid who wouldn't even sneak ice cream after midnight <laughs> while her parents are asleep. And like... if she did, she'd feel bad for a month. <laughs> yeah. She's the most innocent looking character that we've yeah. seen. And so after that, um, Veronica confronts her mother and... This was a strong candidate for a cringe line. They they decide to handle this with a negotiation. They actually call it that. So we're going to deal with this exactly as your father would like. With a negotiation, I'll start. And they're both terrible negotiators. Neither of them bargains for the ability to sometimes sing co-lead on the bridge. They're both really bad at negotiating because Veronica's like, my terms are... Like, you and Luke Perry can fuck all you want, but you can't do it in this house. And Hermione's just like, that's fine. Like, he owns a home. <laughs> <laughs> and a place of business. Like, I'm good. And let me tell you, Archie walks out sometimes and I think he's into it. <laughs> no, like, Hermione's just as bad because she's like, oh, um, stop shopping online and going to clubs. Which, like, Veronica can't do anymore because you cut off all of her cards. She can't pay for things online with a wink and a smile. Like, you've already won this negotiation, Hermione. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's in a position of power. I don't know. This scene was stupid and pointless. Yeah, all we learn is that Hermione is going to tell Hiram, Hiram, Mr. Lodge, about that she forged Veronica's signature, and that's about it. Which I don't get the consequence because he would already see that she signed it saying that she wanted to give the contract to fred so why does it matter whether or not veronica also did who knows i just feel like this guy's got bigger concerns when he's in prison right i drank too much of the toilet wine and some of the other guys are threatening to shank me but sure let's go on about this fucking signature you know what this is just really razzing my berries <laughs> so yeah we move on from that to jughead being arrested as a suspect in the torching of jason's car and but sheriff... for very tenuous reasons like sh sheriff keller's just staring at the murder board like god damn it this kid knows more about this case than i do <laughs> no, lock I, him up i wrote that down he's like staring at the murder board like huh hmm oh there are connections i wonder here. what the significance of this is <laughs> but we also learn jughead is an elementary school arsonist and he's like that's a tenuous connection you think just because i burned down one thing i'd burn a second thing of an incident that happened six years ago where you spent some time at the Riverdale Juvenile Delinquent Center for uh, attempting to burn down Riverdale Elementary School. I was playing with matches. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep in mind that at this point, Polly is still at large and they were just conducting this manhunt for her. Did Sheriff Keller just be like, well, can't find her, give up on that one. <laughs> Uh, who's next on my list? <laughs> uh, okay, Jughead, why not? Maybe... Oh, hey, I know right where that Jughead kid is. He's Maybe... right at the high school. I'll just go get him. <laughs> Maybe he mistook Jughead for Polly, and he realized his mistake later, but he's trying to play it off. Uh, you're uh, not Polly. Okay, Jughead, is it? Um, yeah, I'd... it was weird. There was no real evidence there. Other than, like, he had the same logic as Reggie in a previous episode of, hey, you wear dark clothes and you seem kind of like a loner, so I'm sure you killed someone. Uh, Betty very generously thinks that Bug, uh, that Jughead is innocent on what I think is the pretty flimsy uh, evidence that she was literally standing to him the whole time the car was burning. Right. <laughs> I didn't do it, Betty. You have to believe me. Of course. I was with you. The whole time. Yeah, she was at the car when they found it, and then they went back to get Sheriff Keller together. And then they went again to the car. Yeah, there was never a time when he could have done that. So obviously she knows. I also really like that they let Betty just go in alone with Jughead into the interrogation room. Oh, and yeah, hang she just out. goes into the interrogation room. Yeah. It's a really progressive conjugal visit policy that they've got going on <laughs> in this sheriff's department. If it had been an actual conjugal visit, that would have given this episode an extra point. <laughs> yeah. No word on if they let her bring in her black wig to the conjugal visit. <laughs> Here's a sticky maple to raise your spirits while you're in the Ruskow. <laughs> <laughs> like, does Jughead know what she's into at this point? Or is he still in no. for a shot? I'm sure he likes it. He's in for a shock. Next episode, there's going to be a scene where he just like goes up to Archie and he's got 
like a thousand yard stare like <laughs> Betty did things to me and I don't know how I feel about it. I'm so sticky. <laughs> I think there's water in my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, Archie and Luke Perry, uh, they arrive and bail Jughead out with Luke Perry, like, whipping out some falsified business records on the spot. He's just like, yeah, I know how to lie to the police. There's no good parent on this show. Yeah, because FP doesn't even show up to help. <laughs> if Luke Perry's supposed to be the good guy, but we know he's, A, having an affair with his employee who's also married and he's falsifying police evidence. If you stack these things on paper, Luke Perry's also kind of a bad guy. Yeah, I, I wonder if we're getting hints that he's got a more sordid past that like plays into this whole murder thing. It doesn't seem to be framed that way, but if you look at the evidence on its own... Yeah, he's a little sketchy. It's a little weird to just be like, sure, I'll falsify an alibi. Especially because he doesn't need to, because again, Betty was with Jughead the whole time. I think time. you mean constructing an alibi. Oh, no. No. Um, Yeah, that was strange, but I thought what they were trying to do was, oh, an Archie kind of calls out Luke Perry for abandoning FP and Jughead to the cruel winds of fate that Luke Perry felt bad enough that he wanted to, like, make it up to Jughead, and that's why he falsified this alibi. Yeah, that's that's what it seems to be played as, but it's it's an odd way to do it. And it sort of seems like they're all trying to give FP another chance because Jughead's willing to, which is sweet, possibly misguided, but very sweet. Yeah. Like, when FP finally arrives, like, three hours late, his first impulse is like, how about I punch out the sheriff? That'll help, right? Such a good dad. <laughs> That'll clear the air here. <laughs> yeah, the, the scene between Jughead and FP at the end of the episode was really good. They, like, try to negotiate whether Jughead should live with FP or with the Andrews. And FP is like, you know what? I'm too much to screw up. Go with the Andrews. And so Jughead is like, okay, this is what you need. I'll do this. And then FP pulls him in for a hug and whispers, don't come back home until you learn how to wear suspenders. (laughs) That was another good Jughead scene where, like, you can see his inner turmoil. And like you said, Sarah, like, the actor Cole Sprouse plays it really well. And I think he's head and shoulders above most of the rest of the cast here. Absolutely. You can totally tell that he does not believe a word FP is saying, but is going along with it anyway, which is difficult to convey with no lines indicating that. Yeah. It's all in his face. Going back to what you said, Hunter, I think that really is like the end result of like, you know, I don't, I don't know what the quality of the Zach, the Sweet Life and Zack and Cody show is like, but Cole Sprouse has been on camera for 10 years longer than the rest of the cast, thanks to starting off when he was 12. So he's got a lot more experience in this than the rest of them, who, by and large, this is their first uh, time at bat. Yeah, he's an old pro. <laughs> by this point, yeah, he's like 20-something, and he's like, I've been doing this for a while, guys. <laughs> Let me show you how to emote. <laughs> I mean, we joke, but he's got more experience in acting than you or I, Hunter, have at our careers. True. So, yeah, he's he does have a career and he shows it here versus I think all of us like Betty and think that Lily Reinhardt does a good job. But there's certain scenes such as in the attic when she's talking to Polly and getting emotional. She just kind of like jerks her hands around and emphasizes things strangely. She hasn't quite developed like the subtle acting skills. Yeah, this is something Sarah and I talked about a little. Sarah pointed out that um, Lily Reinhardt and Camila Mendez both have kind of like a little bit of cartoonish acting qualities to them. Mm-hmm. And cartoonish facial features, too. In in a good way. I mean, they're both beautiful women, not taking anything away from them, but they have really prominent features. Yeah, Lily Reinhardt's eyes are like six normal so person big. eyes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're little. enormous. She's like half fruit fly at this point. <laughs> yes. She she actually took the eyes from Wally, who's like 30% <laughs> eyes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm, yeah, I sound like I'm talking trash on her, but she's a beautiful young lady. Uh, you know, it's just a joke. When she listens to this, as I'm sure she will, I don't want her to <laughs> feel like we're, we're bagging on her. No, nah, we're fans. She's one of the best uh, 
one of the best actors on the show and definitely the best or second best character. Absolutely. So after that, the Andrews and Juggy all bond over the forging of a time card to prove his innocence. <laughs> and then uh, we decide what's going to happen with Polly. Cheryl arrives and has her great moment where she says that, okay, I don't think my parents care about Polly at all and they just want the baby and it's not safe. Such a stunning revelation. Like everyone's like, what? The Blossoms have ulterior motives. <laughs> Never could have guessed. And Polly is really nice to Cheryl and says, oh, Jason used to talk about how much he, he loved you. And I expected it to go further with like, yeah, he even used to <laughs> accidentally call me your name. Sometimes for days at a time. Now that I think about it, he never called me by my name. Oh, that was Jason, though. And he only wanted to have sex if I wore a red wig. <laughs> yeah, Cheryl looks like she's about to say, damn right, that should be my baby. But uh, I, Polly has a very cringy line where she says, At the home, the sisters said each of us had a guardian angel. Your mind, Betty. I couldn't yeah. stop vomiting. Yeah, that was really bad. And also, I thought you had purely negative associations with that fucking tomb <laughs> that you were locked up well, in. It's like Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> it's still she's she still has some of that within her. It wasn't so bad. The daily self-flagellations of the Cat of Nine Tails really grows on you. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's this cell may not look <laughs> like much, but it's home. <laughs> But yeah, so the gang takes Polly to Hermione's place to hide her out, which is a choice. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think just put Polly in the janitor's closet with Jughead, and then Mustache Hat Man can take care of the baby. See? Yeah. (laughs) We have several options, but I guess she's moving in with Veronica and Hermione, which is, to credit the Riverdale writers, didn't expect <laughs> yeah. that. It's it's interesting. I will be curious to see where this goes. It, it really seems like it's out of left field. But hey, at least Hermione already called Hiram and told them about the stuff with Anna's construction. So everything's out in the open and everything's clear now. Veronica went straight from, I'm at you, to, hey, can you do my pregnant friend a solid? <laughs> Yes, it's definitely not just a contrived way to bring Veronica into the A-plot, for sure. (laughs) We also end on this scene of Jughead seems to be rooming with Archie and Luke Perry, but I thought when he left the police station, he went with his dad, so he kind of like changed his mind Mm -hmm. off screen. Uh, And Archie rolls out, uh, pulls out all the stops for Jughead, an air mattress... Jughead doesn't need much from what we've seen. And uh, I also like Jughead's closing monologue. Hope. A word so close to home. And is tricky. And I know he means that his home life is complicated, but I want to believe he's sitting there staring at his monitor, racking his brain like, oh, why is it so hard to spell hope and home? Why can't it be something (laughs) easy like necrophilia? Uh, His monologues are not always the best, but... I, at least he's right next door to his girlfriend. Yeah. So honestly, this makes Jughead's life a lot really easier. Does. And then we discover that FP is drinking in his trailer and he has Jason Blossom's Letterman jacket in his closet. <gasps> Ta-da! What a terrible crime lord. Like if I would have taken anything out of that car, it would have been the thousands of dollars worth of drugs. <laughs> yes, not the incriminating jacket. <laughs> Yeah, what's the point? What are you going to use that for later? (laughs) For the same reasons you use it, Hunter, obviously. (laughs) You know, sometimes I just have to unwind after a long day. Uh, Yeah, it's it's a reveal. Um, So we know FP is suspicious. If we hadn't realized that, like, the strung out leader of the only gang in town was suspicious before. Yeah. Uh, So uh, who wants to do the wrap up? I think I did the last time. Ooh, um... I guess I'll. I guess I can do it. Um, Oh, no, Kevin, go for it. Polly is still alive and pregnant and now living with the Lodges. Uh, Neither the Blossoms nor the Coopers really care about Polly, but Cheryl trusts her now. Veronica and Hermione make peace with each other. Juggy lives with Archie. Luke Perry and FP have a turbulent history that we find out about. And FP is the person who burned Jason's car for, as of yet, unknown reasons. That's a really good summation of all the different tangle plot lines though. yeah it feels like very little has really happened though like i i guess jughead living with archie might come to something and fp having burned the car is obviously like 
an advancement in the main plot, but otherwise this really did seem like a filler episode. Things didn't advance very far. I think we could have covered the fact that the Letterman jacket was hanging in FP's closet earlier. Like when Jughead goes over, he could have seen it. That would have made sense. That would have been interesting. It would have made a scene like confrontation between he and his dad more spicy where he's also like trying to like edge out of the door and piece together the fact that his dad may be a murderer. Right. And then it would have added drama later because he would have been like, I just got interrogated by the police for something you probably did. Overall, a much better choice. But, you know, that's not how this show works. (laughs) (laughs) We are in the hands of the gods of CW. Mm -hmm. Too true. You guys got some cringy lines for us? I have a ton. (laughs) (laughs) I I might have even stopped writing them down. All right, so first of all, I'm just going to cover it by character. uh, Veronica's some retail therapy to salve my emotional (laughs) wounds was pretty bad. Then when she's talking about her confrontation or her battle with her mom, and she says, Reggie, this is how we lodge women roll. We faint, we parry, we approach, we retreat. And I was like, but none of those things are like an attack, like a cut or a thrust. So you just kind of dance around. It's the worst description of conflict ever. And finally, for Veronica, um, when she talks about her father getting arrested, it's my mom sat me down on the edge of my canopy bed. Yeah, that was rough. <laughs> that one really stood out to me too. It's just such, I mean, it's good for her character, I guess, that we're seeing that she's that kind of person who has to like brag in everything she says, but it's it's really not a good look. Hunter, that, you actually hit my <laughs> cringest line with that. It, it reminds me, there was a song that was released a few years ago by this boy band. Um, and they had this song with the chorus that went, she looks so perfect standing there in my American apparel underwear. I'm like, why would you write it like that? No one needs to know where you bought the underwear from. <laughs> oh, was that a One Direction song? No, that was someone else. Um, but it feels like it could have been Five one. Seconds of Summer? Yes. It feels like it could have been a One Direction song, though. Before I go on, other cringe lines that you have that I haven't mentioned so far. Uh, the one we haven't hit yet was Cheryl's hashtag, sharpen your pitchforks. Like, just riling up a mob. Like, that. you'd think someone could have talked her down from that. Like, maybe, maybe we should be a little more circumspect. Oh, Cheryl yeah. had a bunch. Everything she says in the police station is bad. When she's like, I have information both of you would find interesting vis-a-vis my brother's case like no shit it's about your brother's murder case that's what we're here discussing at the police station i have really valuable information about the river vixens tryouts (laughs) (laughs) like of course that's what it's about and then um the well oh she has a few others one is about polly she says I think she's crazier than a serial killer on bath salts. (laughs) This is the worst Cheryl dialogue we've ever done. I also find it's not safe. It's not safe for JJ's baby. Just (laughs) awful. It's weird that she's always like, JJ's baby. Not yours, Polly. JJ's. Yeah, Polly has no ownership over that baby. I excused a lot of Cheryl's dialogue, though, just because I was thrilled to see her back. Like, she brings so much to the main cast compared to a lot of the other people here. Um, so I was like, thank you. You're back. Sorry. You missed the best episode so far. Yeah. I think she's going to have some more stuff. Like she has a lot of room to grow and develop still. And she's one of the more dynamic characters on this show. So I'm glad that she's back. Sad that our beloved Reggie is. Yeah. Yes. There was actually a line that I like in this episode, other than the trust fund line from Reggie, which is obviously (laughs) the best line of the episode. But I like the awkward thing when Jughead and Betty are holding hands and he's walking her home and she's like, thanks for walking me home. And he says, oh, isn't that what people do if they're in our, you know, situation? He's awkwardly trying to get around saying that they're dating. I think it's cute. Yeah. Yeah. That was super cute. I think that Jughead is very realistically written as a teen boy and he stands out, I think. I, it seems clear that he's also kind of the writer's favorite yes. character. That would make sense. Okay, final scores for the episode. Mm. 
I know you guys weren't the biggest fans of this one compared to last yeah, time. I'm giving I'm, this one two out of five matches by the elementary school. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure if it's just that this is a bad episode or if it just looks especially worse by comparison because we just came off the high of episode six. So I'm going to give it 1.5 awful guardian angels. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was a... Uh, one out of four bars of Archie's guitar noodling in the garage. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Who's got some good predictions for this? I actually don't have any. Like, my mind just kind of, like, shut off during this episode because we basically just jogged in place, so... This is tough for me, too. Um, I guess my thing was, next episode, I'm going out on a limb, Archie's mom is back from <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> That's 100% what's happening and if I'm wrong, I will if eat crow. If she's here, I, I really hope they just redo the whole Luck of the Irish plot from the Disney Channel movie. <laughs> like, Archie finds out his grandpa was a leprechaun. Uh... <laughs> they have to have a Halloween episode sooner I believe or later. all of Riverdale is a Halloween episode. <laughs> <laughs> True. It's perpetually yes. fall there. But I guess the other thing is, like, who has the clout to order the serpents to kill Jason and the only people that seem to have that kind of leverage would be the lodges or the blossoms. And I don't know. It's, I'm still trying to figure out this whole murder plot. Cause it seems like FP and the others were involved in murdering. And when this. you put it that way, like uh, it doesn't seem like the lodges should have any actual stake in this. Like they were not connected to the town until like a month ago so it it seems like the blossoms are the only ones it could be when you phrase it like that hunter yeah and why would they want to kill their own son so it's strange because the only people we've seen pulling the strings of the south side serpents are the lodges Mm -hmm. um i don't know it's like if they're tied up in this then maybe they had their own reasons maybe the south side serpents just didn't like this we do also have the long-standing feud between the blossoms and the coopers Mm -hmm. so True. There's a lot of, uh, I don't know, syrup-related intrigue there. <laughs> I'm going with, you know, the Southside Serpents just decided this kid thought he was too cool for school with all his extracurricular <laughs> activities. He was a poor drug dealer. He missed a drop, and they had to rub him out, and that's it. That makes sense. <laughs> that's it. That's a uh, case closed. <laughs> You're welcome, Sheriff Keller. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Hopefully the next episode will pick up. Uh, Hunter, will you take us out? Absolutely. Until next episode, you can reach us on Twitter at Gritty Reboot Pod or by email at Gritty Reboot Podcast at gmail.com. You can also check out our new website, Gritty Reboot Podcast.com, for more info on the show, past episodes, and upcoming news. We look forward to seeing all of you next time.